good afternoon everyone welcome to today's coffee with curiosity this monthly lecture series aimed at non scientists was started 2 years ago by icts we at jawaharlal nehru planetarium are very happy to associate with icts and host these lectures as i have mentioned a few times in this forum we are a unique planetarium in that we have in depth non formal science education activity these culminate in a 3 year program called reap that is research education advancement program today's pr speaker professor vijay raghavan has supported planetarium when reap program was started in late 90s by professor vishweshwara sir the program has become very successful with whole hearted support of the scientific community of bengaluru it is very heartening that young scientists from iisc icts university of agricultural sciences are strengthening this program by regularly teaching and interacting with undergraduate students number of students showing interest in the program has also seen a big jump so much so that initial few lecture classes are conducted in this very hall and the class resembles the look of a public lecture sir so far 100, 130 students who have attended reap have gone on to pursue phd program many have joined premier research institutes as faculty and some are teaching in iits and universities some of these have come back to teach in reap program i extend a very warm welcome to you sir <clears throat> we are very happy that our chairman shri kiran kumar is present here he has been supportive to all our activities welcome to you sir <laughs> there are several eminent scientists in the audience i extend a very warm welcome to professor spenta wardia founder director of icts i extend warm welcome to all the distinguished guests and to the members of the audience now i request vijay kumar to say few words about icts thank you so let me also extend a warm welcome to everybody on behalf of icts so it's uh, very nice to see so many people coming up here so it's my job to introduce uh, a few slides about icts and particularly about the second anniversary of uh, kapi um, icts is the international center for theoretical sciences we are a center of the tata institute of fundamental research in uh, mumbai Uh, we have very broad goals in enabling uh, scientific research in india we want to bring all kinds of scientists physicists astronomers biologists mathematicians and put them all in a roof and then see what comes out so it's basically what we want to do so to do this we have a three pronged uh, approach so we do something called programs uh, the second one is we do in house research we have excellent faculty amongst us and the third is scientific outreach of which kapi is a part i'll just uh, go through that but then our campus is so nice so i couldn't resist uh, just showing you some pictures for no reason so just the, the pictures will come up every now and then so we do in house research in a variety of areas of uh, science and mathematics so we have people working in data assimilation in dynamical systems there's a unit working on monsoon modeling uh, statistical physics kinetic matter physics biophysics fluid dynamics moving on to mathematics the people on partial differential equations geometry probability and other interdisciplinary aspects we have a very strong group in uh, gravitational wave astronomy which was involved in the ligo discovery and we also have very Uh, a strong group in uh, string theory and uh, quantum gravity so that's another nice picture uh, we do programs so these are basically uh, various classes of meetings which we organize we have pedagogical schools we have workshops and conferences we have discussion meetings and from 2007 which is when icts started we have had about 150 programs and 61 discussion meetings and more than 6000 people uh, with a significant fraction from abroad have participated in these programs So th at the top you see a, a listing of uh, uh, certain programs with uh, and you, you see that it covers a broad range of science uh, aspects. In addition to that we also have named lecture series uh, which is in a uh, partnership with the Infosys Foundation the Infosys ICTS named lecture series. Uh, we have the Subramaniam Chandrasekhar lectures in the physical sciences, uh, Srinivas Ramanujan lectures in the mathematical sciences and Alan Turing lectures in uh, uh, biology computer science and related engineering areas. So another picture for no reason. uh the third aspect is scientific outreach uh so we have a 
many uh, scientific outreach programs going on. So we had Mathematics of Planet Earth, which was an exhibition showcasing the diversity of mathematics held at the Vishweshwara Museum a couple of years ago. We had the Einstein lectures, uh, very regular uh, lectures that happen for the past two years. We have, uh, in honor of the founder director of this place, Professor C.V. Vishweshwara, the Vishweshwara lectures. The first one was given by Kip Thorne, the 2017 Nobel laureate in physics, and of course, Kapi. Uh, to do this, we have a fantastic set of people um, which really enable uh, this story to go on. So two years of CAPI. So we started uh, CAPI with curiosity as a public outreach series. Uh, we started this way back in October 2016. So the first year we had a gamut of talks, uh, a broad range of uh, speakers from all disciplines came and gave wonderful talks. Uh, you can see the speakers themselves are thrilled by the kind of talks and the kind of audience that they had. Uh, the second year continued that. We had another fantastic set of uh, talks. Uh, and the second year speakers also reciprocated by being very, very proactive in what they're doing. But this year we also had a nice new component. We, it wasn't just lectures, so we started having more interactive sessions. There was a set of experiments that Professor Rubasi Shana from Raman Research Institute got. She worked on, people were fiddling around with the quantum eraser, doing experiments, and, and just toying around. We also had lectures where the audience was involved in various uh, demonstrations. For example, this is something from Zorana Zerausik's lecture where she was trying to illustrate the ideas of self-assembly by getting a bunch of volunteers and moving them around. Our audience has not been left behind. Some of you will recognize yourself here. And look at the eyes, they're pretty gleaming, uh, really looking forward to what's going on. Uh, we cover a gamut of uh, age range. Uh, we are very young people. We also have pretty senior people. And age doesn't matter, the curiosity remains the same. Uh, every speaker, uh, this is just a representative photograph, is typically hogged after the uh, talk and really uh, is asked lots and lots of questions, so much so that we have to pull away the speaker from the people. Um, so it's, it just shows the popularity of the program that's going on. All our talks are archived on YouTube, so if you miss something, go back to YouTube, look at our uh, channel, ICTS Talks, uh, and every one of the copy talks is archived here. In addition to all the programs, uh, the ICTS programs, which are also available in the so if you look at the number of subscribers, we've really grown. For a scientific institution, something like 20,000 subscribers is not so easy. Our audience uh, has been a steady, uh, the copy audience from the first uh, copy. Uh, we've, we've never had anything below about 150 people. So that sort of tells you the kind of interest that this program has generated. We did a feedback, uh, which many of you were very kind enough to fill up. Uh, so we wanted a feedback on the kind of things that we've been doing, what we've been doing right, what we've been not doing right, and so on. And so we asked people, how many copy talks have you come to? So the significant fraction has come to more than uh, 10 talks, which is about half of what has happened. The age group is diverse, so it's not just school or college kids. You'll see some seniors as well. And we also asked people on how we, we are doing with things like the choice of speakers, the question answer session, the venue. We, we're pretty positive on all accounts as far as we can see. One thing that we started out uh, CAPI was to have some sort of a societal impact in basically in trying to raise scientific awareness amongst the public, uh, encouraging students to take up scientific careers, and uh, basically it's just a part of the city's culture. So we just wanted science to be something that you go as casually as you go to a music concert or a cricket match. That's as casually as it should be. And uh, the feedback seems to reflect that. So we asked people, has this been useful in raising scientific temper? Majority do seem to agree. How about encouraging science, uh, people to take up scientific careers? Again, we have a positive response. And even as part of the city's culture, we seem to have made some impact. So the last uh, bar graph here shows something that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, we really wanted this series to be something that showcases Indian science. I mean, science is something that you can do in India and have a satisfying career. So it's important to show that there are very good scientists. And more than half of our copy speakers are people from India working in Indian institutes. And so we asked them, did you know all of them before you came to Kapi, or did you not know them? So for the graph says that uh, at least 90% of the people who responded did not know all the speakers. So we've done a good job in actually introducing Indian scientists to Indians. All right, so that's the summary. So we are, have a bunch of upcoming uh, talks lined up for the rest of the year and the early next year. We have people in nanomachines, uh, people speaking of nanomachines, phase of matter, cosmology, number theory, and many others that you should uh, tune for. So like last year, I mean, a series like this should really continue for a very long time. That's what we feel so. I hope everybody does feel so, like last year. Do you think we should continue? Good. OK, so that's a good thing. Uh, so we've had a good societal impact from whatever we can uh, get. 
So it'll be great if people want to contribute to this and run this in the long run, and, and it'll be great to hear uh, from people. So with that, uh, we come to today's copy, uh, and I'll ask Professor Spentavadia to introduce the speaker. So let me begin by thanking the outreach team of the ICTS, especially Vijay Kumar Krishnamurthy for spearheading this uh, amazing set of lectures, actually. And uh, really, thanks, Vijay. And take it forward. And please continue to be on this committee. <laughs> so uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, Vijay Raghavan, Vijay. So he just reminded me that we had first met in IIT Kanpur. <laughs> I had seen him, but I didn't know that he had seen me also. <laughs> so Vijay is a biologist of great distinction. And uh, he is presently distinguished professor at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And uh, previously, uh, before his present assignments, he was the director of the National Center for Biological Sciences of TIFR, which he has taken to an amazing level. He took it to an amazing level, actually, for, uh, for it was a great inspiration for me and my colleagues when we started building the ICTS, that the NCBS was here. So presently, uh, Vijay is a principal scientific advisor to the government of India, and uh, all the best and good luck, Vijay. It's a great, uh, it, it's a great undertaking and uh, I, I hope you succeed really. So a little bit of history. Vijay graduated uh, from uh, IIT Kanpur. He's a chemical engineer by training uh, and uh, he did his masters and uh, also in IIT Kanpur and PhD in molecular biology from uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. After that, he went to Caltech for his uh, postdoc and uh, then returned back to TIFR. So Vijay's main and important contributions in science uh, are in developmental biology, genetics, and neurogenetics. The, his research primarily focuses on the important principles and mechanisms of nervous and muscular systems and how this neuromuscular system <coughs> directs specific locomotor behaviors. So this is his, the main body of his work and uh, for which he has uh, been very well recognized. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, Indian Academy of Science, Indian National Science Academy, the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, the uh, Royal Society of London, and also the uh, foreign, he's a foreign associate of the US National Science Academy. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, uh, people of uh, such distinction, uh, there is a question that arises in your mind that a very, very active and brilliant researcher steps out into public life and, uh, and, uh, and why? I think uh, the why is obvious because he wants to serve India. And uh, I think we are very proud of that, Vijay, that uh, you stepped out. But you keep on coming back to your laboratory every weekend, and that's also a great thing to do. So with these few words, I'd like to, uh, first I'd like to request uh, Sri Kiran Kumar to hand over a memento to Vijay Raghavan. Now, Vijay, may I invite you to deliver your talk, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Vijay Krishnamurthy and Spenta, the director, Dr. Kiran Kumar, and everyone else over here. Um, it's actually, uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying how wonderful it is to have this program uh, here uh, regularly, once a month. Uh, and ICTS and the Planetarium should be congratulated for having this program. Uh, we constantly talk about the importance of outreach, uh, but here is an example of people actually doing something about it. 
And the fact that it's uh, streamed live is absolutely fantastic for everyone except the speaker. Um, and um, uh, that's, I think, really good. And we should now move to actually uh, translating the speech to text uh, and then you know, the text to multiple languages so that it's more widely uh, accessible. So fantastic. Um, so I'd like to talk today about science as the fulcrum for social and economic change. And I'd like to argue that there are very few instances in the history of the modern world where science and technology can have a transformative impact on the planet. And when we look at those instances, typically they have come with extraordinary collateral damage. Uh, successes have often taken place by having another who one can exploit. And there are very few examples where successes have taken place in an inclusive manner. Uh, today is a time for India where science and technology can be the fulcrum for social and economic change in a manner, in a complex democracy where we take everyone together and we have us lifting ourselves out of poverty in a sustainable manner for the planet. If India manages to do that, then it will be not only an example uh, for us, but for the whole planet, because with its large demography, India's success can have um, you know, dramatic impact. So there's a real opportunity for us to uh, do well. Uh, so for science to be the agent of change, for it to be the fulcrum, it has to be strong. The fulcrum has to be strong. It has to be correctly positioned so that a strong crowbar can lift disproportionately heavy loads. For this to happen, scientists constantly argue that science must be strengthened. More resources need to go to science. Otherwise, how can science play this role? And civil society wants these impacts of science to come in a manner which um, you know, don't affect the environment negatively, but also they want these successes to come rapidly. And the government is caught, governments of the day everywhere in the world are caught between um, trying to see impact coming relatively rapidly, but also knowing at the same time that long-term investment is needed for success. So how does one reconcile these? And I'd like to say that, again, these kinds of questions about, you know, we need to strengthen science for it to have an impact, we need to do useful science, or we need to do basic science, are all wrongly posed questions or arguments, and we need to step out of these kinds of arguments into something which is much more interactive, much more uh, collegial, and much more impactful. Now, India is unusual amongst post-colonial countries in that it invested in high-end science and technology as well as lifting its people out of poverty after independence. So we had investments in primary education, health, uh, agriculture, and so on. And some would argue that we should have invested more and better or differently. And those are arguments which one can keep having. And at the same time, we invested in cutting edge science. We started universities, engineering colleges, medical colleges, invested in space, atomic energy, and research, and so on and so forth. And some would argue that, at that time, people argued that these were wrong investments, and we should first focus on the former and then on the latter. In any event, the result of these multiple fronts of uh, investment has resulted in India being a salt and pepper country where we have the economic power, the science and technology capability, at least, of a Western European country, of France and Germany perhaps put together. But we also have the salt of India, Bharat as it were, much of India's poor, disconnected from this pepper of capability. And I use this salt and pepper metaphor because that this mingling of both is a very difficult challenge. You can dissolve, you can pour water on this and dissolve the salt, but the pepper is left disconnected with India. As many people have commented, much of our science and technology 
uh, even the excellent aspects are a short walk from India. So how does one connect science and technology to India by, but at the same time retaining its excellence, which is very important. So um, as a result of the salt and pepper capability, many argue that India has the wherewithal to be a leader in science, uh, and indeed it does. And it, many also argue that we can use science and technology to lift our people from poverty and use our trained scientists and technologies and policymakers not only to save India, to help India, but to help the planet. And yet others say that this has been a constant refrain for decades and India will yet again snatch defeat from the jaws of victory and these are the cynics who will, uh, we need to dis disprove. Now science itself can be transformative in two kinds of ways. Sometimes a mere idea, a small idea, can transform the entire planet, and these ideas can come unexpectedly, and, or they can come as a consequence of decades, centuries of um, you know, culture in science and thinking. They come unexpectedly, but they're rooted in, in, a, in a long tradition. And the uh, concept of zero and the concept of the decimal point and the placeholder system transformed the world economically, politically, and socially in a manner which at that time one could never have envisaged. So an idea can have an enormous impact. And human curiosity, culture, and ideas have a huge place in themselves, just like art is important, music is important, science is also important and should be an investment by the government. But unlike art and music, uh, the investment in science is substantially more nowadays, and therefore the relationship between science and society is not just one of letting curious people be, but how can one continue investment in curiosity and why should one do that? Science and technology also are completely intertwined, and this has been so for millennia. And for some reason, we have very recently started looking the, at them as separate enterprises. I don't have time now, but all you need to do is to look at either, all you need to do is look at the history of individuals in science, of institutions, of countries, and you will find that, you know, uh, those institutions, countries which invested in science and technology, and this happened in an intertwined manner, did phenomenally uh, new things, great things, and so on and so forth. So the impact of science and technology can be rather phenomenal. Uh, and these together have transformed economies. Now, millennia ago, science was something which became a natural consequence of human imagination, linked in many ways to trying to understand the mysteries of the planet, linked to the need to, of, for agriculture, for navigation, and so on and so forth. And this went on for centuries in multiple ways in multiple cultures, and India is notable for that in terms of how it has used uh, science, astronomy, uh, for its commerce and for its navigation and for, the, for its agriculture and so on and so forth. But something happened a few centuries ago which changed the planet hugely. And this was the European expansion. For a combination of reasons, again, we don't have time to go into that, European curiosity, Copernicus and others, for example, later on Galileo, uh, thrived in a context of European exploration of the through the oceans. This had been going on for some time, but it started expanding, and this fed back, this ability to explore fed back on trade, it fed back on political rivalries in Europe, it fed back on the expansion to set up colonies all over the world. So the Dutch, the English, uh, the French, the Italians, the Norwegians, all started exploring the world and claiming different places as their own. Here is a picture, I think it's in 1572 from Calicut, um, showing uh, Europeans landing over there. I think it was the Dutch, I'm not sure, or the Portuguese. And, uh, and these colonies were established as trading posts, and I'll come to a little bit about what kind of trade went on. 
But there was also some interesting kinds of um, inputs which came from Europe. Ambassadors came asking our rulers for rights to trade, which were generously granted. And these were the proverbial thin end of the wedge, which resulted in the growth of colonization in India. So here's a picture of Sir Thomas Rowe in the court of Emperor Jahangir. And Rowe and Jahangir became good friends. Uh, and that resulted in trading rights, not only in Surat, but the expansion of the East India Company. And the consequences of that is something which we know. Japan, about that time or a little later, took a very hard view against anything, anyone foreign, and regarded all European inputs as barbarian, and took an extreme, um, the other extreme viewpoint of not having any interactions at all until much later in the 19th century during the Meiji Restoration, and we'll come to that. The Dutch explored Africa and the East Indies. That's a Dutch flag, not an Indian flag. Um, and in the East Indies, they went all, what is, what is called the East Indies, they went all the way to what's now Indonesia and beyond. And they also set up colonies on the east, uh, on the west coast of India in Malabar. And one of the Dutch uh, governors, Van Reed, wrote a book in Latin called the Hortus Malabaricus. And it was compiled over a period of nearly 30 years. It documented all the uh, fauna and the flora of um, uh, that region, interviewing Vaidyas uh, in Kerala. And this book, this, this 12 volume set is amazing because it has got a description of all the flora of the region uh, along with drawings of the Vaidyas and texts in Malayalam, in Arabic, and in uh, Latin. And this was translated by K.S. Manilal, who's still alive and not very well, unfortunately. And these 12 volumes are, are extraordinary um, example of the details of the earliest explorations of science by Europeans in India, which resulted in an explosion in the spice trade, then went back to Holland and resulted in Linnaeus and his documentation of all of uh, flora. And, and that taxonomy led to a whole lot of other exploitation of plants for medicinal purposes and so on. So this was an extraordinary uh, uh, interaction, which is symbolic also of the European expansion and its success, both in trade and in colonization on one side and through science on the other, but also symbolic of the neglect and the poor connect of Indian science and technology in many aspects to our well-being and our economy, both by our citizens uh, and our scientists on one side and by our rulers on the other. And this was a decline which was possibly there many, many years, uh, centuries ago, and continued or at least didn't uh, stop and, and reverse direction. Japan, as I mentioned, during the Meiji Restoration in the mid-19th um, century, decided to unite all its warring shoguns and have a central structure which on one hand took great pride, some would say disproportionate pride in their country and their uh, central organization and the emperor, and on the other side opened up hugely by a set of treaties to Western technologies and science. And this resulted in an extraordinarily strong base for mid 19th century onwards uh, in Japan of science and technology. So what one sees today as a success of science and technology in Japan has a very old basis. Another Asian power, China, was also had a strong tradition like India in science and technology, more so in technology, one would say, than in science. But nevertheless, the links between India and China historically had resulted in a inseparable link between science and technology and culture in extraordinary ways. China was subjugated not by European colonialism, by, but by European peddling of drugs on scale. The Opium War was a treaty which allowed the formalization of the export of opium to China. 
But before that, there was rampant export of opium in a disorganized manner. But this formal export of opium continued the subjugation of mainland China and handed over Hong Kong to the British. The point of all this is, is simple. <coughs> it is that you have a situation where the extraordinary growth of Europe economically, socially, and politically, which we see up to the early mid 20th century period, was done by a use of resources from the colonies, material and people, and by an unlimited supply of fuel to the engine of economic growth. And therefore, the so-called magic which one sees in economic transformation is not a replicable model in today's world and should not be. We had multiple industrial revolutions, again, resulting from the extraordinary impact of science and technology in Europe. The first, second, third, and what's now called the fourth industrial revolutions all have their center in Europe, America, and partly in Japan and Korea, but dominantly in Europe and America. <laughs> so this is the uh, a, a famous loom, in, I think in Manchester or somewhere, or in Germany, um, a machine hall. And it's important to keep in mind that these kinds of technologies which allowed the mechanization of production were done by combining metallurgy and mechanical engineering and later on electrical engineering in a manner which resulted in huge machines which powered industrial growth. And much, much later, decades later, centuries later, these kinds of machines still are dominantly made by Europe and later America. And even when the means of production are local, the technology for production is important. And this, again, has a long tradition which we must keep in mind. So we had, as I said, and we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution resulted in the coal and the steam engine driving production. And that production was fueled by raw material from the colonies. The second industrial revolution resulted in gas, oil, and chemistry being the fuel of, uh, you know, of, of growth and production. But that also resulted in the colonies being used wherever factories were set up over there as sources of very cheap labor, but also of market produce which came back from uh, the West. On the left is Moksha Gundam Vishweshwaraya, who during the Industrial Revolution in India led the placement of technologies uh, in a pioneering manner in Mysore state and elsewhere. And such scaling up of technologies in India was very rare, and this is an unusual example. So we didn't, again, in terms of state power, did not or could not grasp these technologies at a foundational level. Later on, in the 1960s, nuclear power and electronics dominated uh, the growth of industry. And there too, while India did invest in nuclear power, it didn't invest substantially in electronics. And the growth of the electronics industry in the West dominated consumer um, uh, purchases all over the world. And India became uh, a reluctant purchaser of electronics rather than a manufacturer, uh, a situation which uh, Taiwan and Japan and South Korea managed to change and China too managed to change later. And today we have the fourth industrial revolution which combines not just manufacturing of various kinds but combines that with uh, internet in a manner uh, and the internet of things to allow cyber physical systems to dominate everything we do. And one aspect of that is how data is used to impact on decision making. So what we have today is an extraordinary situation which the buzzwords often thrown about are artificial intelligence and machine learning, but fundamentally very long prevalent algorithms and mathematics and statistics are made feasible in practical applications today because of the ability to handle data on a large scale and the ability to um, store data in a manner which was possible never before. So this has resulted in extraordinary successes. Iconic amongst them are the ability for a computer to beat anyone in chess or Go, but also practical applications have been 
is coming at mind-boggling speed. One example is a very important problem about how proteins fold. Proteins are strings of amino acids, and different proteins are a combination of different units of amino acids, and how they fold is a key determinant of their function. If one could predict from the sequence of amino acids how a protein could fold, it would be absolutely fantastic, rather than having to do experiments each time to, what the f to ask what the fold is. And this problem, both theoretical and experimental, uh, has been a challenging problem for decades. And there is a hedge fund operator, D. Shaw, D. Shaw in Manhattan, who designed a computer, Anton, whose sole purpose is to solve the protein folding problem. And he basically has cracked this problem, much to the irritation and dismay of many protein folders otherwise. And this, this computer can do nothing else, just as the computer which can beat you in chess can do nothing else, but beat you in chess or at Go and so on. So dedicated high-end computers which can analyze data and which can you know, take decisions in deep domains are becoming more and more feasible. And with machine learning, these computers are becoming better and better. So domain-specific AI will keep getting better, as also general AI, which will impact on decision-making in general. And this, apparently, the threat which is thrown at our face is that unless we skill ourselves, unless we ready ourselves for this fourth industrial revolution, we are going to end up in a situation where uh, we are largely unemployed and go back to being a vassal state in a manner similar to the early colonial periods because we will, manufacturing will move to the sites of uh, demand and capa high tech capability, labor and price arbitrage will no longer be relevant and we will therefore be forced to buy products and have a large number of unemployed, unskilled people. And that's the danger which is being given to us. And I'll come to a little later about how one can actually end up solving these kinds of uh, challenges. <coughs> now, in this situation where we've had these multiple industrial revolutions, and it can be argued that we have been at best minor players or bypassed, ha have the revolutions bypass us completely, what can we do today? <coughs> And as I said, Indian science is rather amazing. Indian science and technology is rather amazing because we have the capability to understand at every fine level of detail every aspect of these problems. Distributed all over India, there are people who know what is to be done about these kinds of problems. We need to scale up that community. And we also know not only what is to be done, we know how it can be done in a variety of mechanisms. Yet, if you look at Indian science today, it has <coughs> an enormous, as I said, disconnect with solving these problems on scale. Much of Indian science, while it has the ability to understand and focus on these problems and see what needs to be done, is tentative and keeps stating what needs to be done, but as a community does not actually engage in doing this. It's easy to keep beating various horses which refuse to drink by saying, you must interact, or the government demanding that, you know, uh, the government demanding that you must interact, or science saying that, you know, we need X, Y, and Z before we interact, and so on and so forth, and society demanding dramatic changes. The question is, what is the solution to this conundrum? And my view is that the solution does not lie in constantly stating the problem. The statement of the problem and the answer to that is different from the solution. The answer is simple. Answer is that you know one must interact, but the solution is much more complex, so we need to find a solution, and I'll come and tell you what the solution I think is reasonable shortly. <coughs> so science has got enormous capabilities, but it does seem, and the view is that it's extraordinarily disconnected, and there are exhortations for it to be connected, and I think that's not sufficient. <coughs> Society <coughs> has a different set of viewpoints. At independence, there was an extraordinary trust amongst all citizens and 
a trust, uh, uh, all, all citizens in the government. The expectations was that the government post-independence um, could actually be relied on to look after society in every possible way. And we did not have a particularly argumentative society. Industry at the time of independence, similarly, ref, uh, depended on the government to have flexible laws and conditions to allow its growth and did not become simultaneously the engine of innovation. So there was a disproportionate focus on the government as a solution provider in these three pillars of our society, uh, uh, of India. That is society, industry, and the government. Civil society, industry, and the government. Subsequently, what happened was something in interesting. As industry grew in a manner which it was clear was focusing, as industries do, on their interest, there was a civil society backlash. And civil society demanded, both of industry and government, laws, rules, and regulations which protected citizens in different ways. Environment, freedoms, ability to exercise uh, various kinds of opportunities, and so on. This has resulted, over the last few decades in particular, extraordinarily valuable laws which protects citizens and give them a variety of rights. Corresponding to that, we have neglected the other two pillars, the role of industry and the proactive role of government in exercising responsibility for the population, with the result that we have got rights on what needs to be done, how much education there must be, how much health there should be, how much various kinds of freedoms there should be, how much opportunities there should be, without actually having an engagement on developing resources and foundations which are needed where these rights can be exercised. So we have a situation where our practice of our social obligations does not have enough opportunity as much as our laws say that they should have. So we need, correspondingly, a responsible growth of industry and a responsible aspect of government in a variety of sectors, health, agriculture, industry, and so on. And in my view, both these are now happening, and therefore these three pillars will become equally strong as opposed to being one or the other disproportionately strong. For that to happen, we require, again, science to play an important role, and I'll come to that. So the third pillar, science, society, the third pillar is industry. And industry has an uh, enormous uh, challenge in India, but we must not underappreciate its successes, just as we must not underappreciate the enormous successes of science or of civil society. Indian industry, in many sectors, is very powerful, both nationally and globally, and has provided jobs on scale. Our public sector and our private sector have been extraordinarily uh, transformative, and you just have to see Bangalore as an example of how that has had an enormous impact. Um, by industry, I would include uh, major ventures such as BEL, HAL, the Space Research Organization in Bangalore, the Defense R&D Organization, as well as private industry. And private industry has made India, for example, uh, world leaders in generic drugs uh, and in vaccines, and these are not to be underappreciated. For example, a few years ago, um, there were, I think, 200 million doses of a meningitis vaccine which India made and exported to Africa saving enormous number of lives. Um, the HIV drugs available um, at uh, cheap prices, again, are a major Indian achievement. Uh, and Indian manufacturing is, is growing very rapidly now, and Indian industry in every aspect is doing really well, except that it is not competitive in these current times of the fourth industrial revolution, and the challenge is how, that, how can that come about. So just as Indian science knows what to do, its foundational ability to be a uh, strong fulcrum in doing it needs a challenge. Indus Indian industry also needs to be truly innovative. So science and industry have extraordinary potential, but they need both strength and daring to come together to solve problems. The other major challenge and opportunity India has is 50% of our population. India has far too long 
like the rest of the world, created a society where the principal role of women is to ensure the success of the male in driving the engine of the economy. Collateral roles in employment and so on have been just that, primarily collateral, and this has been a world phenomenon. India is unusual that in 1947, when we became independent, we had the right to vote to everyone, unlike other countries in the West, which took a long time, were discriminatory against women for a long period, and the right to vote and other rights for women came about legally in a slow process. But the legal rights are one aspect, Practical rights and opportunities need to be broadened. That needs to happen, and that needs both a cultural and a structural change, a lot of which is happening, and this is a fundamental issue which needs to be addressed squarely. Components which allow more flexibility to women at the workplace, uh, better job opportunities, um, you know, and so on are important. They're very important, but Fundamentally, there needs to be a change in our economic structure which makes women an equal partner rather than a subordinate partner in the workplace. And that is a global problem, and India can show the lead over here. There's another problem and a challenge, and this is the final set in my list of industry, civil society, science, uh, women, and now it's India versus Bharat. This is the salt and pepper metaphor I alluded to, for much too long, the elite in India have looked at opportunity and possibilities linked entirely to their purpose in a manner which essentially ignores a substantial part of the country. This is a very dangerous trend which can result in social structures breaking, and that must be reversed now. And in many ways, technology today allows that reversal in a manner uh, which was never before possible. And we must grasp that. And that's why I said lectures such as these, other you know, reading material in science, literature, uh, in technology, in medicine, must be available to everyone in a bilingual manner. You should be able to open any text and read it in your language as well as English simultaneously so that you are not disempowered just because you're not facile with English. If this changes, then people will not only know their rights, but will have the opportunity to exercise them in multiple opportunities. And that's a major thrust which we are embarking on, and that needs to be pushed amongst all sorts of other aspects, looking at our economic growth within India and not only as an export possibility. So in this background, when we know what needs to be done, when our science and technology enterprise you know, is so evolved that it can understand any aspect of science and technology, when our industry has the capability of linking with science, with academia, and going ahead in a daring manner, when our society's demands are self-evident, and there are key people in society, leaders, who understand how these two can be linked for societal development, for the development of women and for the rest of Bharat, what is stopping us? This is the final um, sort of question which we need to carefully answer and all of us need to be part of the solution. What has been happening, and this has been happening <coughs> for decades, is all of us who are the elites, and remember that any one of you who gets a scholarship is in less than the 0.8 or 0.1% income group in the country. We, we are an extremely uh, disproportionately um, staggered country in terms of income distribution. So all of us over here and in similar contexts have an enormous responsibility. But most of us, with notable exceptions, and you know the notable exceptions are very important, as a group, as a community, we have become expert at articulating the problem, but not necessarily being part of the solution. When asked to be part of the solution, we point out whose responsibility it is to actually solve the problem. It's the municipal corporation, or the state government, or the central government, the systems, and so on and so forth. But just as there is a distribution in quality amongst us, just as we need to become better and better scientists, and we are not the best scientists, 
our median quality needs a huge improvement. The same is true of every other sector in the country. Just as we find our institutions could be run better, that we could do our science better, that we could work in teams better, and we don't because of a variety of internal limitations, so too with other sectors. And therefore, rather than point out what others should do at an absolute level, asking them to perform at peak excellence, if all of us work together, then a combination of imperfect capabilities can actually result in something which is much better than perfect. And that's something we need to understand. We also need to understand that in terms of decision making about what to do, the approximate is often better than the perfect. Let's get started on common ventures. We may not all agree about what to do, but as long as we apply machine learning and artificial intelligence to our own tasks and learn from them, we can error correct. We can go in one direction and decide, oops, this is not the right way, let's go in another direction. And we should work together. Therefore, we should, when we point out errors made by others, we should allow room for discussion and changing of views. If we sharpen the debate so much that you put people in corners, put them on the defensive in every argument, then you result in having quality debates, but not quality action, because the demand for action is always approximate, and it's always error prone, and it always requires correction and collegiality. So there's a second aspect, apart from this huge cultural change which is needed in all of us working together, and that's something which has been called the innovation paradox by Javier Serrera and William Maloney. And basically, this document in which I agree with many things which are said, but uh, also disagree with many aspects, makes the following argument. It says that developing country capabilities are enormous. They understand what technologies should be used for changing their situation. Yet, for some mysterious reason, they don't get on and do that. And therefore, it points out rightly, in my view, a fundamental issue, which we constantly keep criticizing each other. We say, why is it that Indian scientists for example, one hears this, do, don't do well in India, which I think is wrong, uh, but many people say that they don't do well in India, and when they go abroad, they do brilliantly. Why is it that we were at the same level as X or Y or Z country, South Korea or China, 20 or 30 years ago, and why haven't we moved? And as if that somehow a mere change of will and working together, both necessary, are sufficient for change. This study argues that that is not sufficient. It makes a very interesting point, which I think points, shows us the reasons for early successes in India and the complexities we face. It makes the point that when you're far from the goal of the highest end science and technology being used for social and economic transformation, then it is relatively easier for you to start meeting successes. So if you don't have a health system worth the name, if you don't have an engineering college system worth the name, or a medical system worth the name, or a space program at all, or an atomic energy program, or a basic science program, then getting started when that end is far away results in extraordinary and notable success. But as you go towards the next step beyond that success, you have institutionalized structures from the passion and the drive of early innovation. And that institutionalization has meant, and this is not true just in India, but in every economy in the world, has meant that a tension in taking decisions of a kind which discriminate between what should be done to reach that goal as opposed to the range of possibilities which are there. And many countries go into gridlock having discussions or having multiple kinds of approaches, but not taking decision making to go over here. I pointed out economies such as in Europe and North America and how they grew. In today's world, for the growth of our economies of to that scale, in a democratic country, where there are huge problems about global 
uh, of planetary level uh, changes in climate uh, and uh, the consequences. The success in solving this innovation paradox puts a substantially important role on the heads, on the hands of the government. That is not to say that you should leave it to the government to solve these problems. That is only to say that you are the government, right? And this is the quandary we must get out of. We must understand that we are the government and we must you know, take our steps in this very complex situation about decision making and be a part of the government in decision making. In other words, as I said before, the atomic, there are times when science has had transformative impact on the planet. The Manhattan Project, the A-bomb and the H-bomb are examples. The Industrial Revolution, which is again exploitative in multiple ways, are examples. But in today's world, science as a group can actually have this transformative uh, impact on public good. And we need, therefore, not a Gandhi or a Nelson Mandela. It would be absolutely fantastic to have one driving this. But we can't wait for that to happen. It's not, it's, it's not something which will magically happen. But all of you are a tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth of a Mandela or a Gandhi. And all of us working together can actually have this transformative effect. And this is not an idle exhortation. This is actually immensely feasible in a peculiar manner in India as in no other country because of the very structures which you have developed over decades. So, what is to be done? We make the mistake very often by answering this question at the level of the individual. And then we take it as a threat to individual freedom to do what we want to do because something very important has to be done. A war has to be fought. A victory has to be achieved. And therefore, all of us must drop our interest in algebraic geometry and you know, go and fight this war. Nothing could be further from the truth. We must pursue every interest we have with the fullest passion and not neglect it at all. But we must simultaneously ask, what is the level of abstraction? What is the level of granularity where we decide what is to be done, right? It, it, and how it should be done and who should do it. In my view, the level of abstraction in the context of Indian recent history, in the context of what we have achieved in Indian science and technology, is actually the city. And one such city is Bengaluru. If the top institutions in Bangalore, if our, the Indian Institute of Science, all the other institutions, the medical colleges, the engineering colleges in Bangalore, in addition to doing whatever they are doing, decide that they will be the engines of social and economic transformation. There is nothing to stop them from influencing the state government and the central government over a monthly, yearly, decadic time scale to have a transformative impact. This is very, very feasible, and this doesn't involve the change of any of you doing what you're doing, but it involves an institutional change in terms of attitude. Now, how does one get about that institutional change? And again, one needs to look at it a little more carefully. It's, not, it's all very well to say institutes must take on responsibilities. If these institutes get together, Karnataka can be transformed, and if Karnataka is transformed, the entire country can be transformed, uh, similarly, and so on and so forth. We need to overthrow an attitude about what and who scientists are. For far too long, we have created a cultural view of scientists as academics and nothing else. So scientists are not just academics. They are responsible as policy makers, as engineers, people working with society. But fundamentally, as some of my colleagues here in Bangalore have said, scientists are citizens first and scientists next. The only people, the only category of people who have the luxury of analyzing a problem and going on to analyzing another problem are journalists. They're very valuable, they should do that, and that's their job, to do it well and to be critical. But everyone else here 
needs to, in addition to being a good journalist, must also be, before that actually, a good citizen. And that requires us to promote, push our institutions to create structures which are at the interface. Just as ICTS has created a structure in which their academics lead in this interface, have a small but dedicated set of people who are involved in public outreach, the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences, the JNC, the Raman Institute, NIMHANS, other institutions need to get together and create a set of people whose principal job, as, as a real job, they are paid for that, they have real opportunities, is to create jobs in a sector where scientists become entrepreneurs, scientists become policy makers, scientists become economists, scientists become agents within the government of the state and the center to solve problems. It's not sufficient to say what needs to be done, we should be involved in the execution of every aspect of this problem. This is eminently doable, and indeed, the countries which have led economics and, and growth all over the world do that. If you go to an ecosystem at Stanford or MIT or Caltech or in Japan now or in parts of Europe, there are huge components which are involved in this kind of an interface. And therefore, becoming a professor should be one small component of your future as a scientist amongst many other equal or sometimes even more important con components. And that's an attitudinal change which we are trying to push and I think it's very important for all of us to have. You can be a superb algebraic geometer as well as a policy person, but that's your choice. But at the level of the institution, there will be enough people who are dealing with the interface without messing up the long-term growth of the institution and its deep domain expertise, so that that investment in basic science in the fundamentals of knowledge continues and prepares us as insurance for the future. So both can, must, and will coexist. How long will this all take? If we were starting this in a situation where you know, nothing was around, then it would take a huge, huge amount of time. And we must thank ourselves that we have the extraordinary capabilities that we can do all of this right now, and we can do this as a source of opportunity for all our people. I remember many years ago, about 15 years ago, there was a delegation of African science leaders from different countries in Africa, all across Africa, who came and had a meeting with scientists from Bangalore held at the Indian Institute of Science. And the discussion was about how to collaborate. It was extraordinary and very depressing to see a commonly held view amongst the Indian scientists that African scientists need to fix their respective countries' health, education, agriculture, energy problems, and so on, before they embarked on programs which allowed African students, for example, to look at astronomy or string theory as professions. In other words, an extremely colonial mindset saying, exploration of the universe, curiosity about the universe, is a right of the rich and not an opportunity which should be open to the poor. India needs to change that opportunity, uh, th that attitude, and that change in attitude amongst all of us can come in two ways, when we are engaged in solving our problems, but also as a consequence of that, we will liberate Bharat from also having access to opportunities which currently it doesn't have. We need to look into that. So that's one aspect. Another lesson comes from another meeting, also at the Indian Institute of Science, many years ago, when the Chinese Prime Minister at that time visited, and again, and thanks to the Indian Institute of Science for organizing these, the Chinese Prime Minister met with multiple scientists from all over Bangalore, and he gave a survey of all the fantastic work which is going on in China, which was translated to us, and he didn't have any notes with him, so either he was a genius or his interpreter was one, but the result was that you know we were left stunned about the way china was using technology i say technology for its economic growth so one of us uh, if i'm not mistaken it was me asked him 
why should China and India collaborate? To which she replied that it's very important that there be a bridge between knowledge and power, implying that China had the power to use the consequences of knowledge for its upliftment, and India had knowledge. And this was a respectful view of the historical idea about India as a source of knowledge, but it was also a slap on the wrist pointing out that you have not had a tradition of transforming this knowledge into technological development, and you haven't taken courage to do that, which we have. And this was a lesson which you know, pointed out again how isolated our scientific structures have become, how negligent our society has been of making real demands of science, and how bifocused our government has been in supporting societal needs on one hand over decades, but at the same time not linking science and society and industry effectively. So we need to bring that back, and there are again attempts which I'll answer during the question hour on how we are trying to do that. So science as the fulcrum, I'd like to end, of social and economic change is something which is happening, and will happen as long as we share a common purpose for India and Bharat and the planet. And this common purpose comes from all of us contributing to our institutions, to make sure that the, our institutions have all the flexibility to do really well in developing this interface, what I call the transfer RNA, between science and society to make it effective. And all the structures which we need to do that are there. So I'd like to end with this sad picture of the Belandur Lake. <coughs> Is an example of what we have done to our cities where solutions are staring at us as responsible citizens, as small and medium entrepreneurs, as citizens who live in apartments along its feeder routes, as scientists who know what the solution is, as citizens in the government, in the municipal corporation, in the state government, in the central government, for decades, at least a decade if not more, this problem has been staring at us. It's a solution which is simple, all of you know what the solutions are. All of you have stated it a million times. It's a good time now to start doing something about it. Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, so I guess uh, I hope you're willing to take questions. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, for the talk. Uh, you talked about the history, how science did in economic uh, change, and you also talked about the perspective okay. it can do. So can you give this some examples that are going on right now um, as uh, to raise enthusiasm, I would say, uh, that what's happening right now, how, uh, whatever you are suggesting, somebody is doing, say for example, one, uh, one example is ICTS, this talk that is happening. Other examples where uh, not just the talk, but the real work is happening in that direction. So um, there are two aspects. I'm sorry, your name, please? Akshay. Akshay. From? I'm okay. It'll be good if when you ask questions, you also give your background. Uh, it's useful for me and for everyone else. So Akshay's question is, are there examples of how we are reaching out to link science and to society and to action? And of course, what's, what ICTS is doing is something very important and admirable. And that needs to be done on a rather substantial scale in terms of science communication. And I won't get into details, but there are ways by which such communication, available globally, can be reached out to people all over the country. Technology is but one component, but quality teachers are the other. And that's something which needs to be scaled up in multiple languages. So there is, for example, a major new venture which we've decided uh, upon in the previous meeting, the first meeting of the Prime Minister's Science, Technology and Innovation Advisory Council to push for all of these kinds of lectures and more and uh, av available in our uh, individual languages across the country. But there's another aspect relates to these kinds of situations such as the Belandur Lake. 
Another initiative which we're trying to push is to take national institutes such as the IISC, central universities, IITs, and so on, have them partner with state government institutes, and adopt a major sentinel site. It could be environmental, it could be social, it could be applications of technology, it could be electric vehicles, and so on, as a long-term mechanism of engaging with society around us in a pan-institutional manner, not just for training, which is a component, not just for understanding what our environment is like, which is important, but actually to solve a particular kind of problem. So the Belandur Lake is one example. And another example, I'm just coming from IIT Kanpur a few days ago. They're working together with the leather industry and with other colleges to see how a significant stretch of the Ganga can be purified, or can be cleaned in a manner which is consistent with all the challenges which industry may, uh, needs and how what does one help solve this problem. So taking these kinds of approaches, both in you know, environmental problem solution, but also in terms of frontier science and technologies is something very feasible and can be taken on at the multi-institutional level. Other questions? I'll let you decide who's to. <laughs> sir, good evening, sir, and good evening, everybody. I am T. Parashiva Shetty uh, from art uh, background, but uh, curiously interested in science awareness among the students. Uh, uh, thank you for your good uh, lecture, sir. My problem is for uh, last two, three decades, we the policy makers, our students and citizens, all of us, looking out for major things, looking, adopting West, he said, feel as a development. What are the policies now before the government making Indian people looking within us? Like I said, India is a country of a rich heritage, science, and technology adoption. But unfortunately, we are not giving any importance to our solving the pro for every problem. We are looking at the problems problems of, uh, solved by the West. For another day, I was read a paper as some Mexican city has solved the traffic problem, they went there and uh, made a survey of the uh, arrangement, they made it. But they are not looking, they are not considering the advice of uh, the local scientists, I mean institutions. This is our problem, sir, major of the things. Because one thing, when we look in within us, its own space, two in, uh, institutions, made us proud, solved many of our, our space and uh, uh, these problems. Because I'm, I'm my request uh, you, you guide the young uh, citizens, uh, scientists here to lick themselves for, for the solving the problems. The major thing is we're looking for everything, for, for pen technology to satellite technology. <laughs> you want to yeah, yeah, that's you, a that's a to, interesting uh, comment which we can discuss. Comment. Yeah, maybe we can discuss this over coffee and. Hi, Vijay. I'm uh, Anirudh from Namhans. So uh, my question is more of general regarding the data sharing when it comes to human genetics research in general. Sorry, data sharing. Data sharing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in human genetics research. So people do meta-analysis of large databases and pull in information, and, uh, but they keep it with themselves. So uh, but we require, uh, in general, more um, genomes of healthy individuals, healthy patient's data, but which is available with the other researchers, but it's not shared in the public domain. So as a community, how do you think these problems could be regulated or addressed? If you could do some work on this. <coughs> yeah, well, this is a um, bit, um, it's a very interesting question. It's a bit, as they say among students, a bit off syllabus, but uh, I'll still answer it. <laughs> I'll still answer it, because it's very important. Um, in general, in terms of data sharing in science, we are not as collegial as we should be. We don't lay down formal mechanisms, and therefore we invent informal ones depending on the context. So that needs to change. There are lots of efforts on changing that. There's also the likelihood of a bigger scale Indian genome project coming, which will have to address that. Um, the other real problem 
which is the elephant in the room in my opinion, is the quality of the data itself. There are two reasons why people don't share data. One is because the rules and regulations are not in place. The other is that the data is of extra uh, extraordinarily and embarrassingly poor quality. Uh, and it's better not shared. Uh, so, you know, both issues have to be addressed. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Aman. Uh, I'm a software engineer. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Your? My name is Aman. Yeah. I'm a software engineer. Uh, so, I'm really intrigued the, when you talked about community and how the 100th and 1,000th of each of us can actually build something really amazing. So, and I'll kind of connect this to, because I'm a software engineer, I see a lot of open source software, and as a developer, I can contribute to a small software and actually build a really amazing software along with a lot of uh, other people. Uh, but this, so this is really amazing, and I was intrigued by the idea of that we can actually move this to, not just to the software world, but actually much beyond that to our communities in our society and in different, different ways. Uh, so my question is that uh, I see that institutes can play a really amazing role there, but what about as a civil uh, person, what I can do, uh, how can I be part of those communities, how I can build those communities, what kind of questions I can ask, and, and, and so, and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah. So thanks, Aman. So uh, Aman's question is, you know, first of all, I didn't mean that one hundredth or a thousandth of you. I meant that you could be a tenth or a hundredth of a Mandela or a Gandhi. So it's actually a substantially greater challenge to you than you know, just a, a hundredth or a thousandth of you. But so what I, what I also suggested, but not in an exclusionary manner, that institutions are the right level of abstraction to take such efforts forward. But that doesn't exclude individuals, and there are some areas where individuals can have a disproportionately large impact either because they're so extraordinarily smart that they come up with something interesting which can be adopted, but also because they belong to a certain category or a community where impacts can be there. So software engineers are an extraordinary uh, example, and those who analyze data in astronomy, in physics, in biology are again another category. In today's world, you can take the available data sources and APIs, application programming interfaces as it were, and develop mechanisms where which decision-making tools on health, agriculture, farming, um, energy, and so on and so forth, can go to citizens in their own languages and in a manner which is explained to them. That's something, you know, as a form of social entrepreneurship and social good, is something which software engineers can do enormously well. What is the actual state of air quality in your city? What does that mean in terms of your decision making? What is the state of your soil health card? Is there an easy way for you to read and take a decision? Right now, all the farming applications, there are about 15 or 20 of them, and it boggles the mind of the farmer to consolidate them and take a decision. There are central government initiatives to consolidate them, but they will only create APIs where people like you can use to develop applications to reach to people. So there's enormous possibilities for people who have deep domain knowledge and a desire to you know, interface that with software in multiple ways. <coughs> and yeah. their individuals can make a huge impact. There's a question here. Hi. Hi. Yeah. So is it legal to have two-part questions? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well uh, yeah. the other one is in the highest yeah. level. Hopefully so related. Leadership, uh, some real anti-science statements. I mean, where does your call for action sit with, I mean, I'm giving the example of the response to the Kerala floods and linking it to Sabri Mala and the kind of response we're having to the Sabri Mala judgment. So, 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 I, so I, I guess you can always take one question over the coffee and one Sorry? <laughs> yeah. You can always take one question over coffee and one here. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I think these are both very important questions. And I think fundamentally in both, your question exemplifies what is deeply wrong with Indian elites and Indian science. 
not with those who make these statements, because these statements clearly are wrong. And you know, no one, even those who make them in multiple contexts, seriously in an engagement will defend them unless they're pushed to a corner and forced to defend them. Why is it then it excites so much interest in our circles, in the elite circles? And I think that is fundamentally the question we should ask and not why people make these statements. In societies as complex as us, there will be a whole range of statements made about a variety of things, many of which are to be better ignored or just plain wrong or gently told they're wrong or firmly told they're wrong and so on and so forth. But our journalism and our elites, people here, seem to think that that is the only statement which is made. Let me take the example of the Science Congress. There have been you know, several Science Congresses over the last many years. The Science Congress is first of all an event which is organized by the Science Congress Association. It's got nothing to do with the government. In the Science Congress, government representatives, the Prime Minister and others are invited to give a talk. Also the Science Congress gets hundreds of papers submitted from all over the country and all of them fall into a curve of quality, few excellent, few okay, few many bad, many really bad. If you look at the Science Congress analysis in the press and amongst our journalists and amongst us, the only thing we seem to talk about is this end, but not at the whole data. As scientists, if you were writing a paper, if you were to cherry pick data and not put it in the bigger context, it would not be a paper which is easily accepted, right? But here in journalism, a clickbait headline is accepted. That's journalists, that's fine, it's their business. But us as scientists spending time, as I'm doing now, on a discussion like that and not solving problems is not correct. Just let it be, get on with it. You know, these are, when you sit on a train or a plane ride, you will have as your neighbor someone who will tell you who's, who's made a lot of money in their businesses and who will also simultaneously have views which are very strange regarding science. Not for a moment will that person apply those ideas to their businesses. People are very smart. Just because they have ideas which are contradictory to what we hold in terms of their articulation, in terms of the perception, doesn't make them any less valuable in, in, the, in a broader context. And in this room, talking about rationalism and so on, I would bet that a great majority of people are believers of various kinds. So it's possible to hold multiple kinds of views in the same brain as long as you know, those don't impact on decision making in specific contexts, and indeed I don't think they have, despite all, you know, noises to the contrary. Uh, questions? Yeah, please. Hello. Is it all right? Yeah, you, uh, can we have her first? I did not necessarily one thing. Oh, I have gone through my life as well, scientist, as an engineer, or even now I am retired in the profession. I wanted to ask you, after going through all these problems of what we know the problems, what the solutions are, still we are not able to solve some of the fundamental uh, solutions of environment, clean air, and everything which is available in the, all the minds are available, but things are not happening as it should be. I wanted to find out whether the present condition of our country, with all the wherewithals available, it really be possible to solve the problems at least for some time with any etiquette. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's possible. That's what my talk was about. We can do that. I think your first point is very important, and the short answer is yes. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question there? Yeah. Oh, oh, there was a question. Okay. After okay. you, and then. Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah. I'm Abhinaya. Uh, it is. Uh, I would like to answer. I would like you to answer my question as a principal scientific advisor of India. Like, uh, it's a strange and sad fact that uh, we don't have practicing uh, science and research in schools. Like, uh, I can uh, guarantee that 70% of children uh, are are deficient of correct understanding of science. So, is there any uh, education policies which India is planning where we have compulsory research and uh, science happening in schools? Like. Um, you know, this is a 
very important question and particularly pertinent in this audience because the new education policy was anchored in many of its discussions by the ICTS and many of its meetings were held you know, by uh, Spenta and his colleagues, uh, Lina Vadia and others organizing that. And in that, there is a chapter in amongst those recommendations which addresses this in the strongest possible terms, saying not just for science, but for science as well as for the humanities, unless there is a mechanism by which quality research is done in our undergraduate colleges across the country, in our state universities at a substantial level, we are doing ourselves no service. It's just a relative accident that we have such quality science despite not having laid those foundations very strongly. They need to be done right away at huge levels, otherwise we are selling ourselves substantially short. Uh, after her, please. Hi, my name is Marisha, I'm a journalist. You touched upon AI, you said that you know, domain-specific AI will keep getting better and better, and so also general AI. Um, I have a general, sort of, a, maybe even a non-science question. What would your advice be um, for students who might be entering the workforce you know, 10, 15 years down the line? Or you know, what would you, how would you advise um, school, schools to sort of adapt and embrace for this change? So, uh, first of all, um, a statement about AI and its approaches and handling big data. The assumption which many people in the computer industry, computer scientists and software engineers make, that having large data sets dynamically allows us to take decisions about what will happen next without necessarily having a deep understanding of the domain is wrong, right? Data is necessary, big data is necessary, but there are multiple solutions which are consistent with data and what happens next, but the correct solutions come from a deep understanding of physics or astronomy or biology or agriculture. Now, in terms of what students need to do, it's not about a 10 year or 15 year time scale, it's about now. Statistics and mathematics needs to be at the foundation of every kind of education along with music, art, and literature. These are aspects of learning which you can do well early on when you're very young. They become more and more difficult as you grow old. And no matter what else you do, they will stand us in good stead. So our education system must stress the value of arts and mathematics substantially. Then we are set. We are prepared for any eventuality, right? It's a great insurance against anything. If we don't do that and we have quality education, quote unquote quality education, only in domains which are important right now, which is important, we will not serve ourselves well. Uh, so, him. So, like, uh, I'm, I'm an undergrad student. Uh, mm, 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 mm. As a person who has a lot of uh, politicians in my family, I find it very hard to talk to them about uh, Im important ma matters. Like, uh, like, uh, uh, like, I find them uh, being engulfed in uh, the highest order of hypocrisy imaginable. <laughs> like, uh, I'm really curious, like, how uh, you uh, uh, sort of navigate through that. Uh, <laughs> you, well, so the question is, uh, you, your name, I'm sorry? Abed. Uh, sorry? Abed. Abed. So Abed's point is that he has got many politicians <laughs> in his family, <laughs> and uh, he says that they are extraordinarily hypocritical, and he wants to know how I navigate in that environment. So the first part, again, I would say, 
while true, is sadly true of all of us. All of us, to greater or lesser extents, are hypocritical. We lead personal lives which contradict our public statements. We are flawed, right? And so is everyone else. So the first step is to understand that such flaws are not uncommon. The second is to ask, why are such flaws there? And the reason, historically, not just today, but every time, is that decisions in public society come from arguments and people getting together and studying those arguments and seeing proximal, very near-term benefits for them or mid-term or if they're convinced on some kind of a long term. When you elect people to office in your school or your college or in your assembly, one rarely examines them for personal consistency in a substantive level. It can be a component at times, but it's more about whether they deliver in whatever way they want to us. And they effectively are a mirror you know, to our lives and the way we behave. And I would say, you know, the lives we lead, I'm here telling you on how the country should be changed, and I'm deeply flawed in many ways, and I could be better. So I am indeed as hypocritical as anyone else. The reason why politicians are particularly battered with this charge is because unlike us, there is a demand on delivery on a short time scale which amplifies this tendency, which we don't have the luxury, we have the luxury of not being caught in that. You know, I can take a very principled view of many things because I may not be asked to actually get something done. When I start getting things done, I'm dealing with the rough and tumble of the world, and I will compromise here to get something else done over there, and you will accuse me of being a hypocrite, right? That's legitimately so. So our job as citizens, therefore, is to do something which helps our, popul uh, our politicians stay closer to the straight and narrow and not require them to you know, give something in this end to get something else done, and make re-election a mechanism which serves our interest rather than proximal goals. And I think it's happened in multiple contexts in our polity over decades, sometimes less, sometimes more. But um, this branding of a group of people, um, oh no, oh no, the second part about how I negotiate with that. Now, before I was a principal scientific advisor, I was secretary in the Department of Biotechnology, and all secretaries are called both to their ministers and to parliamentary standing committees. And what is actually absolutely stunning and remarkable are, well, there are two things which are remarkable. One is the rather widespread acceptance and uh, value given to science and scientists in our country. It is disproportionate to what public perceptions are about what scientists think about, uh, what politicians think about science. Secondly, when you go to a parliamentary standing committee where under oath you have to be examined, it is actually quite impressive to see these same people whom you accuse of you know, not being you know, true to their uh, values are actually quite reasonable and understanding on in terms of questions and the answers which are seen. They're, they're amazing, no matter where in the country they're from. So I would actually take a much more generous view about our politicians when it comes, push, comes to shove in these kinds of meetings. They have been actually quite remarkable. So Vijay so Kumar mm -hmm. points to me that there is only about two minutes left. Uh, Vijay has to leave at about six o'clock. Uh, so I'll take one question from the online. So there is an online forum where- It's not two minutes to six o'clock. Oh, okay, so I- I mean, I don't mind as long as- If you, if you want to take a few more questions, yeah. uh, just, so one of Unless, the online yeah. questions was, uh, from uh, Rajat Krishnan, he says, uh, scientists are mostly passionate about understanding nature, but history has shown that often these ideas lead to technology. Uh, how should people emphasize the fact, this fact, during science outreach talks? During like what? During the science outreach talks. I guess he has probably copy or other things. So this in is mind, a so question you've received by? by from online. So ah, online okay, forum, okay, so okay, okay. So the question is, uh, how does one? Um, I mean, the, the scientific ideas lead to technology. How should scientists emphasize this in science outreach? Yeah, my, my uh, answer to that is that there's been a standard characterization of ideas 
leading to research, testing of hypotheses, results coming out and eventually being grabbed by the market or by uh, society to translate into technologies. In other words, viewing the whole spectrum as a pipeline. And as I said at the beginning, I think that's totally incorrect. A better metaphor is to look at science and technology as a jalebi where everything is intermixed with each other. And having an attitude that, you know, if the, you find doing something of practical value exciting, you do it. If you think doing something of, um, you know, something completely abstract is exciting, you do it. Sometimes these two come together amazingly beautifully. Um, Alan Turing, about whom you have a lecture series at the ICTS, is an example. Turing had some amazing insights into how patterns are formed in biology, on whether any of you are real people or zombies, uh, but also um, invented the Turing computer, but during the Second World War worked in breaking the Nazi code, uh, and successfully. Um, and that was something which, you know, is an example of how basic science and application can be very closely intertwined. Okay. Hello, sir. Uh, there is a question. Um, one second. Hello, uh, Ujjayi. So it was really interesting that you brought this pertinent topic uh, today. So my name is Anirudh. I'm a graduate student in chemistry. I, my main question here is, uh, s you know, we you call this the elitist, uh, elite group, right, in terms of income. With point Sorry, I didn't get the last part. Elite group. So the rest of the population has, in the villages has been untouched in terms of technology. So not to belittle anyone who has done research and you know, towards space in, you know, other, you know, in, in Israel and elsewhere. How, how do you think it's pertinent to the poverty or eradicating malnutrition or in something else that, you know, it has to be the first and foremost importance, given foremost importance, because we still are a developing country and we need to bring that up in order to reach a nation like uh, the in United States or Britain and uh, you think that since developing AI, which has almost digressed a lot away from the you know population that has been untouched, you think we still have to you know get back and educate the poor, or pro as someone said, you know bring about practical science education in schools for the poor, so that you know they can think yeah. for themselves. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a long and complex combination of a statement and a question. And first of all, I'd like to take the last part and say that I don't think I could be wrong. I don't think an approach that we should help others think for themselves is the right approach, right? I think it's more like all of us are together in this. But that's a aside. But fundamentally, let's take the example of ISRO. Former chairman Kiran Kumar is here. ISRO, through its geospatial survey of India, at the finest level of granularity, has provided the government with data on what needs to be done where, what is happening. It's provide, provided through its satellite TV early on educational programs which reaches everyone. It has provided now through its other satellites similar programs through to other countries in our neighborhood. This is an example of quality technology and science which India has embarked on, which has been completely transformative. If for everything you do, we do, we invest in, we should ask two questions. One is the deletion assay. If we didn't have ISRO, would we be better off or worse off? And secondly, if you had more of ISRO, would we be better off or worse off? So both by the loss of function assay and the gain of function assay, ISRO is absolutely awesome. Our challenge is to take on, whether in multiple kinds of more complex, multi-dimensional areas, these kinds of approaches, and we, I think we can. So, hello, sir. Okay. So I'm Shravya, and I'm coming from a computer science background. 
So my question is that, so we are, given that India is a rich country, country of all kind of good heritage and everything, we still face some kind of cultural evils in the society. So I would really love to hear what is your perspective on science and technology, be able to change that culture, bring, bring about a cultural change especially. Because whenever, as a technology person, whenever I try to brainstorm about these ideas, what people say is science and technology can't solve everything. So I'm curious if you think cultural changes are very specific to technology per se, or have you seen anything in your tenure that has really impacted culture of India, or maybe some big ideas that you think would change, uh, bring about cultural change from science and technology point of view? So, I mean, um, I haven't fully understood your point, but let me paraphrase what I think I have. You are saying that um, there is not necessarily an acceptance about science and technology's role in social change, and there's a view that science and technology cannot solve everything. I fully agree with that latter view. Uh, I would go to the extent of saying that science and technology are enablers, and it's up to us in society to decide what it should solve and what it should not. And the mere validity of a technology, the mere value of it, and the safety of it is not sufficient for adoption. Adoption requires social, economic, and cultural buy-ins, and appropriately used in specific context. So there's no question that you know one needs to have cultural buy-in. Uh, but that requires a cultural understanding uh, substantially by scientists, which sometimes is not there. Thank you. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my name is Maniwanan. Uh, I am working at Siemens. Uh, one question is, see, um, of late, we have, we have been hearing that uh, India is uh, making a lot of uh, developments, progress in a uh, lot of scientific uh, avenues. But uh, if you see, uh, over several decades, brain drain from India has been a continuous phenomenon. So whatever we keep uh, doing, still there is a notion that, you know, as you pointed out, that uh, in India we cannot do things. And uh, people, right from their uh, college days, they dream to go abroad and they go and settle abroad and so on. So do you think, strategically, we need to do something about branding India so that this brain drain can be controlled? So first of all, I don't like the term brain drain. It assumes that the rest of us here don't have one. <laughs> uh. No, I'm not saying uh, that. Uh. What I'm saying or, is or uh, diminished. The, uh. the people with, uh, you know, the, the cream of the people, they generally tend to... Oh, uh, that assumption that the cream is no longer here <laughs> may be <laughs> wrong. Uh. Or, or the even greater danger that people will come back in large numbers and we don't see any consequence of that. That could be uh, another danger. It, it, it's good that India has got such a large number of young people and people in general that there's nothing wrong in having a substantial Indian diaspora. There's nothing wrong in having many of us staying here. There's, a nothing, wrong, there's nothing wrong in people going from Fiji to Tierra del Fugo to Australia to North America, wherever. It's, it's one world. And one aspect of it is getting the best talent of Indian origin and otherwise to come and work for India. That, I completely agree with you. We need a change in our institutions, in our environment, which make it welcoming for people of any nationality, including Indians abroad, to come and work here. Much of American physics, just before and just after the Second World War, was transformed by an environment which welcomed people of all nationalities there. America's huge success in science is in no small measure due to a welcoming environment, not just by its science and technology sector, but by society as a whole towards people who are talented from everywhere in the world. So that's something which we need to work on substantially and have that feasible in all our institutions. Yep, thank you. Uh, question there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, good, good evening, sir. Yeah. All right. Can I ask? Um, Excuse me, I'm just so you, this last question. So by the way, I forgot that the okay. six o'clock deadline included the copy. Yeah. So oh, okay. So that. So, <laughs> okay. So, so we should I mind up. That's why we should uh, maybe last two yeah. questions. Uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I know there are at least eight hands. I, I know who have asked. There's just not enough time. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. I'm Varsha, and I come from a renewable energy background. And my question is that 
although we've had uh, goals and India is slowly developing towards go reaching those goals, um, it, although important, is it because, um, is, is it that we don't have a conflict management in place? We idealize conflict as being bad, being noisy, and being unnecessary, that this development has gone in such a slow pace. And are there measures, um, any processes that we have to make sure that conflict can also be good and innovation or different ideas come out of this conflict too? Yeah. So this is a question not just for the renewable energy sector, but for many aspects of development. How, do one, how does one manage conflicting requirements of sustainable environmental demands with uh, growth. And this reflects, this, this alludes to what I mentioned earlier about there being, we have gone through a period where the dominance of civil society viewpoints as a backlash towards a legitimate backlash to not having proper leg uh, regulatory restraint has led to a situation where instead of managing conflicts, we as the elite in committees have exercised vetoes over developmental issues in a sustainable manner over others. Let me give you a specific example. I use the salt and pepper example. Let's say you have a vaccine, right? Or some product, a drug, which will save hundreds of thousands of lives a year. And after, you know, decades of discussion, you've reached a point where you have to decide whether to introduce it or not. There are, as with everything, potential collateral dangers. Those have been minimized to the extent possible. These things, as is our want, you know, we don't take on new decisions unless they've been introduced elsewhere. They've been introduced, let's say, all over the world. How do our committees behave? Our committees rarely, and until recently this was the case, and I must say that recently we've introduced many vaccines in the public immunization system. Till recently, our view was, let's postpone the decision, right? As a committee member, I will retire, right? And I will have another committee meeting till I retire, and another member will come, and then I can go out and talk about how vaccines should be safe, but I will not introduce someone, meanwhile, 100,000 lives a year have been lost, and I don't regard myself as culpable, right? If that isn't hypocritical, I don't know what is, right? And that, this is not the hypocrisy of politicians. This is the hypocrisy of scientists on committees. You don't have a situation where scientists will articulate the strengths and weaknesses and say, let's get started on this. They will typically tend towards saying no to any daring decisions whether it is the Indian Neutrino Project, whether it is the use of you know, power or renewable energy or some other energy in some direction, or vaccination and so on. It's easy to say no. As elites, we have a responsibility because saying no doesn't affect our lives. Our children will always get those vaccinations because we can purchase them, but others cannot. And therefore, we have a responsibility of taking complex decisions. Okay, so sorry, no, no follow up no, questions. No, please, follow please, up. please, please. I, I, there is already about 15 no, people who have up. not yet asked questions. So said, could you please discuss over coffee? No, yeah, yeah, okay, thank so you. Can I, can I? Uh, yes, yeah. One last one. Uh, can, can we. Uh, I want to ask a practical question. Everybody is talking philosophy. <laughs> so, anyway, so, sir, I am an architect and I work with uh, a lot of urban issues in Bangalore. And I'm just referring to one specific question that you pointed out that. We, you, all of you know how to fix that problem which you are showing on the screen. And you also said that, you, as you very well are aware, there are more than 100 research institutions only of the government of India and more than 200 research institutions from the private sector sitting in Bangalore. What can you do as the government of India, since you are today here as, also as a representative of the government of India, to set up a mechanism that this collaboration can happen? I heard Ram, Dr. Ramchandra from Indian Institute of Science saying he knows how to fix the problem. I know somebody else from some other institution. Why, is, why are they not coming together? And what can you do to create a mechanism to solve the problems of Bangalore city? What can be done? So that was the whole point of the lecture. Yes, sir. I'm <laughs> saying what, I think, what, I think what the, institutional I think mechanism can you initiate? In 
what can you do as the government as the what institutional it is so, not obviously not working we have a metropolitan planning committee which never meets yeah but the whole point of my talk which i'll reiterate is that the answer is not the solution you have stated again and again the answer to the problem this needs to be done that needs to be done the solution involves rolling up one's sleeves and engaging with it in a collective manner that requires an interfacial structure which needs to work with all the components and get it done that interfacial structure should be done may created and developed by institutions in bangalore led by the indian institute of science for example uh, with that i think excellent summary let's please uh, give him a chance to have coffee at least and thank him for the excellent thank you. lecture